science, technology, mathematics, engineering, the four pillars to the academic disciplines known across the nation as STEM. From the Big Bang Theory to Silicon Valley, STEM has found its place in pop culture as an amalgamation of nerds, geeks, and losers. Turns out, we're a lot more than that. I'll be interviewing someone from the STEM industry, whether it's a student, educator, or a professional. We'll be discussing everything from their childhood dream jobs to the defining moments in their career. The science of being human's goal is to illuminate the humanity in STEM. People in STEM aren't the socially deficient robots that you see on TV. They're driven, passionate, empathetic, and kind. But most of all, they're human. And sometimes, we're the ones who have the hardest time remembering that. The Science of Being Human shares the stories of members in the STEM industry, from where they started to where they are now, how they got there, and what they learned along the way. The show will also highlight the gender disparity in the industry and answer the question, so what do scientists really do? On this episode of The Science of Being Human, we're joined by Dr. Farisa Morales, a professor and JPL researcher. We discuss overcoming adversity, sacrifice, and building a community. From personal experience, I can say that she's an amazing professor and an incredible person. I can't wait for you guys to get to know her. So my name is Farisa Morales, or Dr. Morales. I work in three different locations. I have a full-time appointment at Moore Park College. I'm a professor, professor in physics and astronomy. I'm also um, a part-time faculty at Cal State Northridge, CSUN, and I teach there also physics and astronomy. And I'm also an active astrophysicist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. When you were younger, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oui, you know, um, when I was younger, so let me go back in time all the way to the moment I suppose I started to ask critical questions about nature around me and this is I was being raised in Mexico even though I was born in the U.S. I was taken to Mexico and I was in kindergarten right so very young so I remember asking you know why does nature behave the way it does and wondering so that that sense of wonder was always in me but I I didn't know what name to give it. I didn't know it would be physics or biology or, you know, et cetera, all these fields of science that we've, human beings have compartmentalized, no? Um, So I was always intrigued by how nature worked, but I never really, it was never really clear to me until I was in my early 20s to figure out what I was going to do in terms of degrees. So... Not to make the answer too long, um, fast forward, fast forward to the time I'm about eight years old, and there's a total eclipse uh, happening through the state of Jalisco, where I was being raised in Mexico. And it was so, so surreal and so weird. I looked down, and the, the, the whole, you know, the midday was getting dark, almost like midnight all of a sudden. And I looked down on the floor, and there's all these crescents on the floor, which saw the basically pinhole cameras as the light beams peek through the, the lemon tree in the middle of the patio <laughs> where I grew up in Mexico. And it was so weird to have, see all these crescents on the floor. And then my mom tells me, don't look up. And I go, oh my God, the aliens are coming. What's going on? Um, but so again, I knew that nature function in a way that I didn't understand and I wanted to know more and I was always in love with school. School for me was my oasis. I couldn't wait to get to school in the morning. I hated coming home in the afternoon (laughs) because I had to do chores and do homework and homework was fine. Homework I actually never complained too much about. So my mom knew that I was always kind of a weirdo in that it was more like, can you stop doing your homework so we can do such and such and such? Like, no. (laughs) Um, My mom always knew that I would be also a teacher because I had study groups at home and I I helped my brother. So somehow she always saw the little teacher in me as well. She pointed it out at some point in my life. In any case, um, I came back to the U.S. as a teenager I had no idea. My biggest concern at that point was regaining my language, regaining the culture, and be, you know, being a teenager. Um, so I get into my, you know, adult age, early, you know, 18, 19, 20, and all I'm thinking about is st- st- stabilizing my life here in the U.S. because my mom decides to go back to Mexico. So you see how my mom's a big influence in this whole thing. So... Um, 
as I stayed in the U.S. alone, I got married very quickly, and I had my first baby at 20 years old. And I was establishing a business with my husband, a printing shop, over 20 years ago. And uh, we were making ends meet and, and growing with the business and having this first baby. So I was very busy. But I always knew that I had to continue or ex maybe give myself an opportunity to explore academia. And the second baby came er later, uh, a couple years later. So I'm 22 years old. I have a second baby. The business is doing fine. And it's doing well and stable such that I think, you know, it's about time. Now that these babies are here, it's probably time for me to go back to school, <laughs> can you, if you can believe that, right? So I take one of my babies with me to the Child Development Center at the local community college, which was Mission College at the San Fernando Valley, and I begin exploring. It's like shopping. You go there and you take all these general education courses, and they tell you all these this avalanche of courses you have to take in order to transfer and what the plans are, because I had no idea. There were no... Um, degrees in my family, right? So my mother studied up to high school in Mexico and there was no talk ever about university or college in, in, our, in our family for whatever reason. And I didn't really know. So I found at, for example, Mission College, the, the platform to, on how academia works. And so in any case, now to answer the question, <laughs> I didn't really know as a child what I wanted to do, but I knew that academia had a lot of answers and I was very thirsty for that information my whole life. And so at, at the community college, I found uh, answers and I began exploring and I also knew since little that I could do the math. I didn't know why, what for. I could do it, it was little puzzles, it was games. As long as you figure out the rules, you could play these games. And, and then, so math was always kind of like a, a little uh, a game. And I started to take the math courses at college, and I got all the way to differential equations and linear algebra. And the counselor was asking, what's your major? And I'm like, I don't know. I like everything. <laughs> I was taking biology and physics and, and so on and, and all the rest of the courses. <clears throat> I said, well, you need to be transferring, so you need to declare a major. And, and, and the counselor said, why don't you choose math? It's a very rare skill. Exploit it. And it's like, okay, I guess I'll declare math. And I applied to transfer. There was a science fair, uh, sorry, a transfer fair that spring. And I applied to transfer. It was like the last year where applications were done on paper in 1999. Uh, and I applied to transfer to one university just because I was going to practice. Like, how do, how do you fill out applications to transfer? I was in no hurry to transfer. I wasn't sure. I was just getting, you know, the general education done. And I applied to UCLA as a math major, and I got accepted. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm going. <laughs> I should go. And so I, but that, by that point, my youngest baby was already starting, um, well, three years, three, four years old, or three years old, was starting um, preschool, and my other one was starting elementary. And I'm thinking, well, you know, in the mornings, I'm going to be pretty, you know, not busy, so I should go to school. And I embarked on, you know, full-time uh, math major at UCLA, and I found out I hated it. <laughs> I was in my senior year at UCLA, and I hated it because all these puzzles had no meaning. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with all these things, right? Mm -hmm. Fine, you gain all these beautiful manipulations of letters and numbers, and, and so what? I needed meaning. And in order to do a math major at UCLA, they had two kinds. They had the applied math and the theoretical. And I, I had chosen applied math because it made more sense in my head just by the word. Mm -hmm. So for that, you had to take a few physics courses in biology and computer science and so on and so forth. And I had seen that physics was a lot more refreshing. Mm -hmm. It had answers to things, yeah. right? And so at this point, I'm discovering myself. And note, I'm 25 years old when I'm changing my major at UCLA from mathematics to astrophysics because I had taken physics. I liked it a lot more than pure math. Mm -hmm. And I took, out of personal interest, every quarter I would take a class in something else, like paleontology, astronomy, whatever else, because I'm at UCLA, why not, right? Mm -hmm. and there's all these experts here. I took astro and I totally fell in love. The language of mathematics was being applied directly through physics to explain cosmo cosmology and, and, and astronomical phenomena, right? And so that was answering questions of the universe. And I said, okay, this is gonna bring me more to where I want to be, answering questions about nature. How, how did I get here? How common is this? And that kind of thing. So it, I switched to astrophysics. And so I'm mid-20s switching majors. So would you consider yourself to naturally be a math and science person? Yes. 
I think that some babies are born with the natural tendency. It's not something you asked for. You can certainly, I mean, it's not completely that's something you wake up in the morning you can do completely, right? You would need mm-hmm. training. You need to build up these skills. But for some people, it's a little easier. And, and in my case, I was the alien of the family. Like, nobody really um, uh, understands, even now, like, how I got all the way to a PhD in astrophysics and all the work that I'm doing. Um, so I certainly still feel a little bit alienated <laughs> from uh, family. But uh, obviously, people are very proud um, I think that some babies are born with natural tendency, and if we have it, then we should utilize it. Okay. And the people that don't have a natural tendency, well, uh, there's training, right? There's there's some basic skills that we all need to gain, because I am obviously not an expert on everything, mm-hmm. and um, we always need have things and, and challenges to work on. Um, but if you have a natural tendency towards something, yeah, go ahead. and I, I forget the word, but it's... Polish it, yeah? embrace yeah. it, recognize who you are. What was your experience like when you first entered the world of STEM? So, like for me right now, uh, regardless of what classroom I'm in, whether it's physics or mathematics, once you get into the more upper division and niche courses, it seems that the uh, men to woman ratio it's about eighty to twenty. So, in a classroom full of like twenty people, it'll be me and another woman. Was it like that for you when you started out? Unfortunately, yes, but fortunately, it's changing and it's changing in the right direction, and that is becoming more uniform, um, at least from, from what I've seen, from the stats that I've seen. Uh, there's a lag be- between, um, like, how many, for example, ac- across the spectrum, right? So how many students now <clears throat> are, for example, in physics or astrophysics? It's close to 50-50 at major universities, mm-hmm. Uh, it's getting close to 50-50, right? It's getting like 60-40, right? It's, 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 so it's moving in the right direction. But how many women, for example, are in um, directors of the lab or professors or chair of the department or so on and so forth? The ratios are, are very, very low, right? Still very sad, like 1 to 10 or something like that. And it's because these women were graduating in the 70s or 60s and 70s and 80s, right? 19, 19, you know, the late 1900s. So it mm-hmm. takes time for mature women to get to these roles, but I've seen now that the numbers in terms of students is increasing. We are here at a community college where um, the campus is not, uh, it's, so it serves the local community, but when you go to four-year colleges, um, you tend to have applicants from around the nation, right? And Mm so the the numbers tend to become a little bit more uniform, but it's still the case that even when women are graduating at almost uniform rates with the men. <clears throat> in graduate school, interesting thing happens. Uh, interesting things happen. In graduate school, um, typically uh, towards the end of graduate school, uh, it is easier for women to choose to either not finish or finish. And then when, when forming a family, women will more often choose to stay with the baby at home than the male. Um, And so women tend to sacrifice their careers a lot more. And so how many of those women actually persevere and end up in positions that are actively in physics or astrophysics diminishes. um, And that's what's been seen in the last few years um, that as we we go up in the higher education, women tend to be more sacrificial for various reasons. So family is one of them. Um, also, we're more, um, we self-criticize a little more. We tend to mm-hmm. be uh, perfectionists, and males tend to be more, um, I don't know, outgoing, or they put themselves out there without so much fear, and it seems to be cultural. And this is across the board. It's not just white or Hispanics, African American, Asians. It's across the board that... Um, women, uh, for example, for family matters, or um, when we submit an application for a job, we tend to, you know, dot all our I's and cross all our T's and make sure that we're like perfect candidates and so on, where you get a a set of candidates from the male group, and they're all over the place. 
Yeah. <laughs> and so you, you, when, I've, when I've looked at applications for jobs now, right, all the women tend to be very well prepared and it's a smaller amount who are submitting their applications where you have a significant larger sample for males and their applications are, can be very good to all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so, again, th there's this um, reduction of women as professionals as you go up the ladder. So, but it, things have improved significantly, but what can people do in the industry to make this gender ratio better, whether it's in the, at the undergraduate level or even in professional settings? What can people do in general? Well, I can, I can look at myself and I can say to myself, right, stick with it. Mm -hmm. Because by just, by virtue of standing in front of a classroom, now um, starting physics students or starting STEM majors look at a female in front of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully some of them can identify, right, the female or, or whomever. Also by being a woman of color, right, because I'm a Latina. Um, it looks like, statistically speaking, I'm facing like a double whammy. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I, and, and I can look around and, for example, at, at JPL or uh, anywhere when it comes to uh, the faculty at any university, I've, I've attended, I had the fortune to attend community college, the UC system, the Cal State system for my master's, and then private university, USC. I mean, so I've been all over the place when it comes to like the different kinds of universities. And when I look out there, um, there's very few women. And there's like no Latinos or Latinas, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know what has kept me going. All, all I know is that I don't, I don't, I never really focused on the difference between the person standing in front of the classroom and myself. They were speaking English, a language I could understand, and I was in love with the phenomena, right? So mm -hmm. to me, what gender the person standing in front never really, I never really cared. Mm -hmm. And obviously, mostly white males. Yes. Okay? But <clears throat> very few times I found in my life, and I remember one specific moment, and I think that was like one of the most crucial moments that I, that I just kind of was crumbling and realized all these things, and it just like kind of like fell over me. Mm -hmm. It was on my senior year. I was already an astrophysics. Well, I was a senior. I was a super senior, right? Because I switched from math to astrophysics. So I had to stay another couple of years as a senior, senior, senior. <laughs> and... During one of those quarters, I was, you know, pretty stressed out. I don't know what it was, maybe the end of the month or whatever it might have mm -hmm. been. That after finals, when I could let all the feelings flow, yes, I looked around and I called my, back then, my husband. And I said, you know, I look around here at UCLA, there's like no Latinos. There's no people of color. There's no people of color in the Department of Astrophysics either. Mm -hmm. There's no blacks. There's no Latinos. There's no, you know, Islanders. I, I don't see anybody of color. And there's very few women. There's like two of us in the classroom yes. out of 30. Yes. And so what am I doing? Am I in the wrong place? Mm -hmm. Imagine that. So that day was a tough day. And I get a knot in my throat just remembering. Yeah. Right, the feeling of isolation or whatever it might be. But obviously, I mean, that day I, I, I did okay in my finals. You know, I, was, I kept up my grades mm -hmm. and I pulled through. I remember it. Remember that day, and I can it just I can feel it again. Yeah. But it's when you let it bug you. The next day, you wake up, you continue to do your thing, you continue to study to love the phenomena, and if you don't focus on that, they're not wearing skirts, they're not wearing nail polish. <laughs> <laughs> who cares? You're having conversations among human beings, and I think it takes a little bit of not ignoring who you are, mm -hmm. because you're always going to be who you are. You're born a female. You're you know. Whatever it is that, that you do. And, um, for example, everyday conversations or studying with your classmates or whatever, if it's all males, right, it, it yeah. tends to, like, you tend to... It's always cars and computers. Miss. Yes. Yeah. You tend to miss. Okay, what about, you know, other females? The, the kinds of conversations we have are very, you know, can be very different. Yes. Um, so you have to find balance in, in your life, mm -hmm. fine. You can say, okay, my professional career, I deal with mostly males, and they're awesome, they're great people, and then find your girlfriends and, and do whatever you want to do with, with your friends who are females. And I found balance. I had a couple girlfriends, and, you know, we would do things that had nothing to do with astrophysics. But, yeah, I got through. So uh, I feel like there's this almost feeling of, of competitiveness between women in STEM. 
Yeah, like when, at least when you initially begin, there's not as much camaraderie between the women and cinnamon. It seems almost like we're, there are two expectations for women, right? One is she's super badass, she knows what she's doing, she sets the curve on every single exam, and there's, on the flip side, the woman who's never taken seriously, and the woman Mm. who, you have no idea how she got there, and there's no way that she's passing the class, but somehow she (laughs) is, so she must be doing something, right? So how, do you feel like you've ever been lumped into either one of those stereotypes? You know, while going through it, it's so cloudy and dusty, and, and you, I didn't see where I was being lumped. What I did see was what you're describing in males, because it's mostly males in the classroom, mm-hmm. and your classmates are, are the ones that you speak with. And mm-hmm. I found that there was, for example, a guy who, whose name I won't mention, and he would, I, I would ask him, hey, blah, 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 did you, um, how did you do on your last quiz? Did, are you okay? He says, I'm not looking at it. I, I didn't pick it up. Did you pass? How did you, you know, how did you do? And he, he would never check his grades, and he was just, like, getting through even courses without knowing what his previous grade was. Yes. How? And somehow this guy did graduate with a bachelor's from UCLA. He was pure physics. I was astrophysics. So we, we would take the same core courses. And so he didn't go on to a master's program or anything <laughs> to graduate program. Right? So, so I was surprised. So you have people like him and then people are obviously like kicking butt and mm-hmm. like, you know, just running ahead. I never knew where I was because I had a little bit of a, a small study group. And um, I had already seen, you know, guys that were, like, way behind or, like, totally scared of their grades or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I always kept myself up at a decent uh, level, what I, what I expected as a decent level. So it's either an A and rarely a B. And if I got a B, I was devastated. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew that somehow I was keeping up the work. And I thought everybody else had, like, straight A's. Or maybe this guy who never wanted to check his scores. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'll give you his first name. <laughs> his last name is Justin. Justin never wanted to check his course. Maybe he had pure A's. I didn't know, right? Because he never checked and he never wanted to share. And mm-hmm. I just didn't feel... Anyway, I, I, I never knew where I stood. Afterwards, mm-hmm. after the dust settles, after you graduate and you talk to your colleagues and remember when and see where people are at and so on and so forth, then you start to hear comments about like... You were always ahead. You can, were kicking our butt. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so they were telling me that I was, you know, one of those like setting the bar. But I didn't. I never felt it like that. When you're in it, I never felt that I was outstanding or or challenging them or mm-hmm. anything. I was always kind of like in a panic, right? I was always in a panic. Yes. I just I just needed to get that homework in. Mm-hmm. I needed to get to the next test. I needed to complete this. Um, and I could never study with them as long because I had to go feed my babies, right? I could, I could, guys, did you get started with the homework? Okay, you're going to do number one, number three. And so we would like to distribute the homework problems and we could talk to each other and teach each other to cover more, more, uh, you know, more ground in, in, in such a short amount of time with those quarter systems and so on. And I did the same thing in graduate school, you know, found a couple of people that I could work with because most of them are, some of them are very friendly, but in, in the, in the STEM fields all right you're gonna find a lot of like nerdy people that the social skills are not necessarily all there (laughs) and so some of them can be want to be friendly but they can't or they don't know how Mm -hmm. so I I kind of grew up or grew grew up in academia knowing this that that most of my colleagues keep to themselves they're actually pretty happy to share stuff with you but they don't really know how Mm -hmm. um and but there's always a couple of people that are more willing to, to sit down with you and, and work, talk about these problems. So I think finding a little group to, to carry on with, it's always healthy, and I never really knew where I stood. Only a couple of comments I've heard of after uh, of my undergrad and grad years that, that you know, I, I helped them keep up the good work and so on, but I don't know. The point is that, you know, just try your best and, 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 and see how it develops. And, we are our worst critics. We are like our worst enemies. Mm-hmm. We we need to just do what needs to be done and see what happens after. Let them be the judge. And even then, when I say them, I, I mean the professors. Yes. And the committee that will meet and deliberate on whether your dissertation is correct and or good enough or so on and so forth. All these defenses you have to do as you get through graduate programs and so on. 
But even then, if um, if they don't agree with something that you're doing, then uh, there's other ways of finding out and consulting with other faculty and what can be done, right, to to push your programs through your interest, your work, and so on and so forth. So you have to have some level of belief in yourself. And if you keep bumping against a wall and people say, keeps telling you, sorry, we can't do any more for you, we cannot do anything else for you kind of thing, then, then fine. But you cannot give up at the first you know, failed exam or at the first, mm -hmm. you, you have to keep trying. You have to keep trying. Perseverance takes work. We'll be back in a few moments with Dr. Morales, but first, a quick message. I wanted to start a little segment on this podcast called Science Spotlight, where I feature one of your stories and share a little bit of your experience. The first Science Spotlight feature is about Isa Montalongo. She's a biotech engineering major from Mexico. Isa chose to study biotech engineering because she wants to be a part of the pharmaceutical industry and help develop new treatments. She was initially interested in medicine, but after joining her high school robotics team, she realized engineering was more the path for her rather than medical school. Her advice to STEM students? Try a little bit of everything and to stop being afraid of failing or doing something wrong. Do what you love, even if it seems difficult or scary at first. Leave your heart and soul with everything you do and share a little bit with the people around you. Isa, thank you so much for being a part of this project, and I wish you the best of luck with all of your endeavors. If you'd like to be featured on Science Spotlight, email hello at thesoulsearch.com with the subject line Science Spotlight. That's hello at thesoulsearch.com with the subject line Science Spotlight. Now back to the show. So on this track of idea of uh, perseverance and failure, how do you define success? Oh my. <laughs> I know, it's a pretty lofty question. How do I define success? You know what? Um, I have a very limited view of the world because I've only lived in two countries. But when you travel around the world, you get a very a lot broader perspective of what a human being defines as success, mm -hmm. right? For some human beings, it's like having a meal every day, it's success. For, for other people, um, having the three cars, your three favorite cars or whatever. So success is going to be subjective to the individual and mm -hmm. their perspective of the world and their perspective of what it is that they, they value. So acknowledging that my perspective is limited um, I've lived in Mexico, you know, Latin America. I've traveled a little bit, not everywhere, um, you know, Asia and Europe and here in the U.S. and so on. I define success as being able to do something that you love for a living, get paid for it, enjoy it, laugh every day because you're enjoying it, have enough of an income to live a life where you have time for yourself and time to relax. If you're constantly in a panic, like I was when I was going through my school, <laughs> um, it's not healthy, right? Because you're going to make yourself sick. Your body is going to react. And so you have to, as a human being, recognize that we're multifaceted, that, that there's so many aspects to an individual that you don't just love, in my case, say physics and astronomy, I love other things. I love spending time with my children. I love painting. I love music. I love, you know, going out in the wild, hiking or whatever. I love doing karate here and there and kicking someone's butt. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love uh, roller skating and I love going to the beach. So if you can find balance among all these things that you love to do and you're able to do it with some decent income, um, and plan for retirement and so on and so forth. I call that successful. So I, I'm living a stage of my life now after I could, 13 years of academic uh, investment and several years of teaching and, and polishing my skills to be someone in the classroom, own that classroom and share something with, with people, brand new students, brand new minds coming up, inspiring somebody to, to take on and continue to push the boundaries of human knowledge. 
and then spend some time by myself and do other things and enjoy my my partner and my kids and so on and so forth I call that success oh it's it sounds so far off from where I'm at right now because right now I'm in, in the in panic. state of panic <laughs> yeah like uh, I was talking to Wyatt um, uh, actually on this podcast and we kind of were like you know we're just like right now in the thick of it we're just like a bunch of suckers doing this all together and just suffering together but it's that sense of community that makes doing this tolerable right and it's your yeah. time to invest mm -hmm. this is when your mind is super fresh you have all this energy and you can make these sacrifices and um th this is the time to invest a little later life gets a little more complicated then you end up with more responsibilities, like mortgage, children. I mean, I, I decided to have children before school, but that was me, right? I, I didn't certainly follow the mainstream path. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was an awesome thing because I'm, I'm entering my, I'm in my 40s, and now my children are moving out of the house. Now they're engaging in their own careers, and I am in a stable position and still relatively young to enjoy yes. uh, the fruits of my labor. Yes. So I was like, yay! Yeah, that's the advice <laughs> that my sacrifice. mom gave me as well. She's like, if you're going to have kids, get them done early. So when you're 40, you're retiring from your kids and then you can enjoy the rest of your life. Right, right, yeah. right. So I, I'm, I'm happy with all that sacrifice. Right? There were weekends where I couldn't take the babies to like the family birthday parties. Like, So I did most of them, but not all of them. And so I would send them off with my husband and and uh or the aunt or whatever so um rarely i couldn't do things with them but when i couldn't i i, I felt i remember feeling guilty that i wasn't being a good mom and uh to me children are an innocent human beings they did not ask to have a mom who was in school and and busy um so i always prioritized on them and playing multiple roles that are very very important in your life can be hard because you don't want to give up on your school, so you tend to be very diligent with your school if you have babies. So having babies actually helps being very diligent with your school. Mm -hmm. You don't linger. You don't you don't procrastinate so much with school um, and other things also around the house. So um, actually having babies was a really good strategy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, note to self, if you want to be a successful uh, person, just have children. Yes, yes. first. <laughs> Uh, so backtracking a little bit, uh, you said that you love to paint and you love to do artistic things. So does art have a place in science? Oh my gosh. Art is a wonderful way to share what discoveries and what's been found, right? So if, mm. if, you, if you describe to somebody a galaxy, yes. you can go on and on with words, but if you show them a painting of it, Mm -hmm. All right. Or or even a beautiful photograph of it, even better. <laughs> or, More yeah, true to life. <laughs> More true to life. Um, again, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Mm -hmm. And so, for example, with me and painting, I think Einstein was the one that said that he now, that at some point he understood why people chopped wood uh -huh. because you could see immediate results. Yes. <laughs> and so painting is not something that you do eat, like like chopping wood. It takes you longer. Like if I'm painting a little mural at home where I saw, you know, clear the wall and put some background and start painting something on it. It's a way to ease my mind into something else um, that has, it, it, it's, it's, I don't know, it brings peace to my soul mm -hmm. to, to drag that brush with color um, across and to then take a step back and, and see the picture that's coming together. Uh, it's very refreshing to me to do. As an educator and someone who loves art and both science, do you believe that an holistic liberal arts education is necessary for students in STEM? Yes, I do. I hear the complaints of all yes. my classmates behind me when I say, you know what? We, when we're waiting, getting exposed to a general education and people say, I hate this. I don't want to take that course. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to know about history. I don't want to know about philosophy. What, how does that, what does that have to do with my STEM major, for example, or vice versa? Yes. Right? People that just want to focus in history and they don't want to take any math or whatever else. Um, it makes you a well-rounded human being. You're gonna go. We're in a world where we're getting bombarded from every direction, and now with these like you know, what are we we'll call it? Alternative facts and like all <laughs> these like false news and so on and so forth. <clears throat> How are you gonna be a critical thinker in life when you receive news? Mm -hmm. and you say, well, that's physically impossible, right? I mean, you just have to have some way of seeing the world 
filtering what's true and what's not true. And how are you going to do that if you don't have information? So, for example, I, I didn't mention this before, but it turns out I was a philosophy tutor on at, at co in college. Oh, <laughs> surprise! <laughs> so, with this, I'm just sharing with you that I can see the value in understanding different fields because really they're not different, they're all connected. Mm -hmm. It's the human experience. We have all these aspects to ourselves, right? From psychology and human behavior to philosophy and our beliefs and our definitions for what is right, what is wrong, and what is logic, what's not, lo and so on and so forth. And it's, see, logic is connected to mathematics, et cetera, and then physics and biology and chemistry and, <clears throat> and how the world works. And history is important for recognizing where we come from, the mistakes we've made to not make them again, perhaps, and so on and so forth. So now our education can be biased, depends on who's teaching it, what the curriculum has, like, you know, from what perspective you're teaching history as well, right, mm -hmm. for example. But having some exposure to this broad spectrum of knowledge, it's, it can only help you. Yeah, it's better than nothing. Yeah, so I agree with the general education. I <clears throat> did have to take courses that I didn't necessarily enjoy, but I always saw the value. I don't know if it's my mom having me do chores since I was little. You have to do this even though you don't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. It was just part of my upbringing. I value GEs, yeah. Okay, one very last question because we're almost out of time. What is <clears throat> one piece of advice you have for anyone who wants to pursue STEM? <clears throat> one piece of advice I have for anyone who wants to pursue STEM would be to do internships. Internships are a reality check, a, what we call in, in um, space exploration ground truthing, <laughs> right? So if you take a, a, a satellite to Mars and you can take all the pictures you want, right? But it's not until you land something on there that you can do ground truthing of picking up a piece of dirt, actually, you know, pulverizing it and seeing with a, spectro or a mass spectrometer what it really is made out of. Uh, you can remotely do lots of sensing, but until you're there, you can actually sense these things um, uh, with higher accuracy. So doing an internship in education is so important because now you get yourself in a situation where even if you're not doing so much, you're hearing the language, you're in that environment, and you can test whether that field is for you or not. Do you have anything else that you want to share with this audience or any final <clears throat> closing words? Nothing new that I want to add other than emphasizing that, that, intern, that exposing yourself to internships, getting your feet wet and your hands dirty is a way to recognize whether that field is for you or not. And also when you're doing internships, do more than one, right? Because you may end up working with different people mm -hmm. under different environments. And yeah, get yourself out there. Don't be afraid of choosing a major. You can always switch. And it's getting late for what, right? You're getting old for, for what? Mm -hmm. Just keep exploring. Make yourself happy. Find out who you are and keep pushing. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Being Human. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Morales, for being a part of this project. It truly does mean the world to me. If you want more information or would like to support the podcast, please visit www.thesoulsearch.com slash podcast. Again, that's www.thesoulsearch.com slash podcast. Thank you all so much for listening, and I'll tune in with you guys next time.